I was talking to to one of my uh, one of my local senior uh, rate payers, and and I was chatting with them, and and I said, I said, and he was asking me, I can't remember what the topic was, and he said, he said, well, who makes those decisions? And I said, well, there's somebody in an office uh, in a capital city, and they're making these decisions. They've never been out here. They they don't understand. They did it without talking to me. And he goes, oh, that Ottawa, you know. And I said, no, that was Edmonton. That <laughs> that was the legislature. Like every this, so we complain about how Ottawa treats us. Uh, the legislature and and Edmonton does the same thing to rural municipalities on a regular basis. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross-Border Interviews, where we delve into the critical role and issues facing rural municipalities in Alberta and their unique election priorities as laid out in a document released in the first week of the election. Today, we are privileged to have as our guest the president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, Reeve Paul McLaughlin. Together, Paul McLaughlin and I will explore the challenges faced by rural municipalities and shed light onto their key priorities that shape their future. Now, rural municipalities shoulder the responsibility of delivering a wide range of services and managing extensive infrastructure networks. These municipalities are deeply impacted by provincial policies, spending decisions, and operational choices across various ministries. The interplay between provincial level decisions is a complex web that we aim to unravel today. The vast array of election priorities faced by rural municipalities makes it a challenge and a difficult task to include them all within the scope of an election advocacy platform. However, in the first week of the Alberta provincial election, the Rural Municipalities of Alberta released a comprehensive document titled Uniquely Rural, Election Priorities for Alberta's Rural Municipalities. Now, this document, intended to supplement the RMA's election website and candidate guide, provides a quick list of key rural municipal goals within six crucial election priorities. The first priority is the adoption of a rural lens, emphasizing the need to consider the specific needs and realities of rural areas when designing an elevating policies. Next, the issue of municipal funding seeks to ensure that rural municipalities have the necessary resources to provide essential services to their communities. Municipal access to property taxes, revenues, and the quest for municipal autonomy are also crucial aspects that shape the decision-making powers of rural municipalities. We will also focus today's episode on the pressing matter of rural health care and social services, recognizing the unique challenges faced by rural communities in developing adequate health care and support systems. And finally, we will explore the topic of rural internet connectivity, understanding it's significant for economic growth, education, and overall quality of life in rural area. Now, while today's episode will provide a condensed overview of key rural municipal goals within each priority area, it is important to note that this is not an exhaustive resource. Instead, we hope that this episode serves as a starting point to further explore and start the dialogue between candidates and the rural municipalities of Alberta and local rural municipal leaders. Now let's start and engage in a thought-provoking conversation with our esteemed guest, Reeve McLaughlin, and gain valuable insights into the election priorities of Alberta's rural municipalities. So, let's go. Uh, so, Paul, I want to start with the question that I think uh, is encompasses the entire document that was released by RMA. What is the uniquely rural uh, platform that RMA released? Yeah, our, our intent is to ensure that that uh, for candidates and, and also for parties to consider using the rural lens in their discussions uh, with with folks, uh, folks that are potentially going to going to vote uh, and making sure that these key policy pieces that include our rural lenses is, is actually part of the dialogue, at the, whether it's at the doorstep or at the uh, at the ballot box. 
So the very first point that goes in the document is a rural lens. You're hoping that the next provincial government has a rural lens look at it. What do you mean and what does RMA mean by a rural lens? And can you go into a little bit more detail so that way I understand it? Because I've read the document, I still kind of am a little confused about what policies and uh, legislations you're looking at to have more of a rural lens attached to it. For sure, yeah, and I think if you if you uh, understand if you kind of consider what the a rural municipal leader does is is they are in an area that has a low population, um, a high infrastructure, and so they're maintaining that infrastructure for the purposes of whether it be forestry, agriculture, uh, or, or energy, and that lens also involves those folks that are tied to the agriculture piece. So, you know, I, a lot of folks in a small town, they, they believe they're rural and undeniably they're, they're in an isolated community or community that's quite small and services are different or less than you'd have in a larger urban center. Um, and then you just extend that to outside. Uh, the, the fact is that our access to, to uh, services, and especially if you really put uh, um, education, healthcare and policing, uh, in that context, it's an understanding that we do have different needs as rural Albertans um, and different contributions to Alberta and ensuring that your policy pieces are connecting with that. So I'll give you a, just a real simple example is ambulance response time. So if you're in an urban center, um, you're using minutes <laughs> in some of our, our rural remote. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm not I, I'm not kidding. It's it's an hour and a half. And, and that is a very different context for, uh, for considerations on, on how you can address a, a complex situation. So what would RMA be looking for in the next provincial government to help address some of these issues? Because just having a rural lens on the policies that are put forward is just one step. Is it actually inter engaging with RMA with the local rural communities? Because I'm assuming the issues in Pinoca County around ambulances are not the same in Brazo County or even up in Woodlands County or uh, Lesser Slave River. So is it more conjunction of working with all rural communities as well? Yeah, and I think that it's you're exactly right. It's very nuanced. I represent 69 municipalities. They're all very distinct and they have very distinct needs. And And it's having uh, municipalities as part of the dialogue um, and, and actually looking that they have contributions to make on, on those discussions. We're not a lesser form of government. We're another form of government. And, and we do have input in how things can be designed, how you can approach key policy pieces, and it's an important consideration. Uh, what would work in one municipality may not work in, in another new municipality. So it's really that dialogue that we're constantly pushing for is to establish that relationship of respect, contribution, and to work together and truly to collaborate on, on policy pieces and problem solving. In the rural lens section of the platform, you talk about grants and you want more of a uh, the the ex expanding and also changes to the way that existing provincial uh, infrastructure grants are supporting rural municipalities. What changes are you looking for from the next provincial government? And have you heard anything from either party? Because we're halfway through this election and it seems like, and I, I hit the home this every single day, Calgary is the main topic and nothing else seems to be talked about in this election. So have you heard anything from any of the parties? You know, we are we are hearing candidates are definitely we you should see the stack of those our, our packages we sent out. It was filling boxes. It filled a room. Uh, and so uh, we we're really hoping that uh, um, it's really that uh, that doorstep conversation. And we're arming arming uh, those those candidates, uh, th those folks that they're going to represent rural Alberta to be part of that discussion. I think that that's the most important thing. So we are seeing that we're seeing it a consideration of 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 what we are doing. I think that, you know, one of the problems with grants, for example, typically the criteria on grants is, is for lack of a better term, urban fied. So it's really looking at population as a driver, even how they're actually written. Um, they're actually nuanced to, to really be something that can only be catered to, to uh, towns and small cities. So we're hoping for an understanding that uh, a bridge in downtown whereverville uh, is just as important as a bridge that lit quite literally in the middle of a cow pasture. Um, that bridge could have consider serious considerations as it, as it relates to moving goods to market, resource extraction, and, and, and having people get to work. So understanding that it is 
nuanced and how those those grant programs work and having that consideration is important. It really becomes extremely complex at the federal level um, because federal government actually uh, considers rural as as communities under 100,000. Uh, and that makes Alberta very rural <laughs> in, the, in the federal lens. Uh, how does the the re- the challenges of government imposing a reliance on per capital capita me- uh, metrics for grant funding negatively impact rural communities like yours, Pinoca County, or even down in Lethbridge County? How does that affect the funding and grants that come to you? And are you hoping, dear God, if the next government when the next government gets in, they start looking at more of a what me- what metrics are you looking for in in the grand schemes of things to uh, dole out grant funding instead of a per capita me- metric? We we push quite a bit for uh, as a great proxy for for the fact that we don't have uh, per capita represented. Uh, we've used roads kilometers of roads is a is a pretty good proxy for infrastructure responsibility for a municipality, and so you can tell very quickly. Uh, what that municipality has. And, and in fact, actually a ratio of kilometers of roads to population is a great uh, indicator of what rural responsibilities are. So we, we've been proxying and using kilometers of road uh, quite often as, as sort of that key key piece. Tied to that would be would, would be assessment is another part that tells you the story too as well. But, but definitely we, to really tell the story, I have 5,000 kilometers of roads in Pinocchio County and 10,000 people. Um, so, you know, pursuing per capita, um, you know, it's hard for me to compete with, with the, a city of the size of 20,000 plus, obviously with only 10,000 people, but I have more roads than, than, uh, most of the mid-sized cities in the province. (laughs) So trying to balance that out. Right. So on on the flip side of that, because grant funding is one area that you, uh, the rural municipalities get money, but also property taxes is another area that you get, uh, funding as well. But while we're talking about property taxes i want to go to the lgff fund that was recently announced and municipalities are going to have to do with 30 percent 37% decrease in the lgff funding for 2024 how is that going to affect rural municipalities and what are you hoping that the next provincial government does to change the decrease in this funding uh, algorithm that they've put forward and hopefully help municipalities like yours yeah, I think the LGFF. It, I think there's some some complexities tied to what is it? What is required by community? What's it being used for? Uh, the whole concept of LGFF was was a transfer of resources to municipalities uh, to allow them allow them to actually undertake the, the good works that they do. And and back in the day, actually, if you if you go back to uh, when Stelmac created it uh, under MSI, the intent was to replace that tax room that's taken up by property tax. And so, so I have in my municipality, so on my quarter section, uh, 60% of the taxes on my quarter section is actually education tax. And so the intent was to give us back some tax room that's, that we just don't have that available because people are paying for property tax. That was the original intent. The other original intent was, was to create sustainability, obviously the S in MSI. LGFF by extension, by shrinking that pot, um, it, it becomes very, very difficult for municipalities to achieve the goals. Really what LGFF should be at this, if we consider the promises made back in the Stelmac days that was actually carried for, forward by the former NDP government when they were in power, um, it should be about $1.8 billion instead of the $400 million. So it's really been, been carved out. In order to, to assist municipalities, though, two other key f- forms of funding, if they're available, would make a huge difference. Water wastewater, uh, as well as the bridge funding. That is, those are two significant grant buckets that that really can help municipalities. Um, the difficulty of LGFF is that we have a conversation that's going on right now, which is a very real conversation. Is growing communities believe they should get more of the pot, and communities that are under financial d- d- duress think they should get more of the pot. Whether those are towns or villages, it doesn't matter. Those are or, or rural municipalities. So that struggle between those two things are two different views of the pot, and they both want more of it. <laughs> and so it's the balancing growth 
versus need um, is going to be a very difficult and defining need is one of the more difficult pieces around LGFF. So my hope is the government recognizes, first of all, make the pot bigger. That's a that's an easy one. Recognizing what we do, we only have access to 10% of, of, the, of the tax dollars in Canada or municipalities. So what we do with a small amount of money is incredible, but we will definitely start slipping backwards if we don't see some replacement of those core fundings, whether it is water, wastewater, bridges from our context, and an understanding that those, those communities that need help, LGFF should be designed to help those communities in dire need. And, and I will say the most bold thing about growth, growth should pay for growth. You have increased assessment, you have more people, your taxes will come in, you will be able to pay for people coming in by growth. You talk about the one point, I, I, I apologize, I forgot the number, but over a billion dollars in infrastructure funding, you would need municipalities across Alberta to sort of to catch up. What's happening now, though? You're hearing from your members. You're hearing that this the funding that's currently proposed under MSI and then in LGFF in 2024 isn't enough even to keep up with the projects that are currently going on, I'm assuming. So what happens if we don't hit that billion dollar mark that municipalities and rural municipalities are looking for? Are there projects that your counties are, or in rural municipalities are looking at and saying, we just can't do it now because we don't have the money and we don't want to put a 20% tax increase on our tax uh, payers because that would be just a political suicide, but B, it would kill our communities. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, you know, without being overly dramatic, we're, we're starting <laughs> to slip. We're starting to slip backwards, Chris. Uh, you know, we, we, we are starting to slip backwards from an infrastructure maintenance standpoint. I think uh, um, our sister organization, um, AV Muni's, uh, they said there's about a $30 billion infrastructure deficit. Uh, we will slide backwards and, and slide backwards quite significantly. And I think that if we don't recognize that, that municipalities have to, a few things need to happen. We need to have more access to tax dollars that, that are leaving our communities. The good folks in Bonneville, for example, have, have there's one of the economic engines of the province. So lots of oil and gas activity. Lots of royalties are leaving their community. A heck of a lot of money is not coming back to their community. And, and those, there's many of those communities are feeling that. And I'm talking with communities on a regular basis that, that with good example is water wastewater standards, um, multi-million dollar projects with no access to funding. If you keep you know, winnowing down um, the LGFF, the, the ability to do capital replacement, uh, you're going to start having a really difficult time meeting even the basic needs of your rate payers, let alone new projects. And we will start to slide back backwards if we do not correct the that funding that funding deficit. It needs to be corrected. You know, two sectors received the largest budget cut in 2021: municipalities and surprisingly forestry, which it would include firefighting. Isn't that serendipitous that we're having that conversation now? And and I'm have municipalities right now, for example, just to be extremely timely, that are fighting forest fires right now with six, seven, eight million dollar bills to date. Um, those are coming out of their reserves and those reserves are intended for capital replacement. So really it's death by a thousand cuts. And I think recognizing that we are quite a prudent group of folks that every dollar you give a rural municipality uh, contributes to the GDP of the province of Alberta is felt every single day. Um, I think that's an important discussion that we need, we're going to have with this new government, whoever it is. What happens, you talk about the backsliding that you might see if the, this the funding doesn't get rectified and properly allocated. What happens if it doesn't? Is it bridges? Is it municipal roads, airports, crucial municipal infrastructures like wastewater treatment plants that are going to see the first impacts of this uh, lack of funding from municipalities? Or what is the what are rural municipalities looking at to say, if we don't get this funding, we have to start somewhere and we have to chop off an arm and a leg from time to time to rectify that we can't run deficits and we can't under no circumstances go into a deficit like the provincial government. So are the hard talks starting now if the uh, provincial government doesn't come to the table after this election? They definitely are. I've talked to a few municipalities that they, they're closing roads. So the first step is, do you have enough money to take care of what you got? A or B? Do you or don't you? If you don't, then you need to start actually decreasing your infrastructure. So then you start closing roads, you start closing bridges, 
Uh, there's no new projects. You don't do any any advancement of economic development. Um, and then eventually, this slope that you're sliding down, eventually you will actually have situations in municipalities that they actually will no longer be viable. I see this with, I've seen this with towns. And the conversation, of, we've seen this with small towns and villages, that history has been there where communities just can't, they don't have the revenue, the tax revenue, they don't have the reserves, they just can't start taking care of even the basic needs of their community. Their water, wastewater system blows up. The new replacement requirements is a $20 million facility. They have no money left in the bank because they've been trying, just trying to keep their head above water. Their community has been shrinking, whatever it may be. And, uh, and basically those folks dissolve. Um, and so we are actually at a point now that if changes don't occur in the funding cycle, you will see dissolution of rural municipalities, which has not happened since the 30s, to be quite honest. I know about eight municipalities right now that if this trend continues, they will be, they will dissolve. And, and how do you dissolve a rural municipality? So back in the 30s, they created special areas that became wards of the state, as it were, and they were, they were controlled by the government. Because um, the hard part is, is how a typical dissolution works. If a small town or village basically goes bankrupt, for lack of a better term, they get absorbed into the adjacent municipality. Well, the problem now is, is that if this continues, a, a rural municipality could go into dissolution. The, your neighboring municipalities are, are just as broke, if not maybe even more broke than you. They can't take you on and they become wards of the state. So um, I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but I know about eight municipalities. I know enough of their books that they this is the path they're on if this isn't corrected for sure. And I'm not trying to put, put you down and pin you down on this question, but what's the timeline? Is it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Like these eight municipalities and I, I've talked to, I'm, I'm assuming the same, per, one of the same people that you're, you're talking to or uh, a few of them. And they say that, every year is a challenge for them and they have to always have that conversation in the back of their head of if we can't do it this year, do we have to look at going into the rural municipality and saying you need to take us over or you need to sort of help us out by that inter-municipal, inter-municipal framework agreement between rural and urban, urban, I, I use air quotes as the urban, but more rural communities. Yeah, you know, quite a few that are, and so I'm talking at the that the rural municipal level. So at the, the local town or village level, um, typically what happens, it, there's quite a few within the next five years. Because, like I said, if this does not change in the next five years, you will you will see more and more dissolutions, more and more questions around viability for a multitude of reasons. Um, the first step in many cases, if it's a small town that's in, in dire strait, is that the adjacent municipality starts to assume more and more responsibility of their services and actually increases their funding. Um, I know of some communities that that 57% of their of their operation spending is actually by the adjacent municipality on behalf of the small town or village. And so so we, but if there was access to if that that small community had access to the funds they need, to meet the needs of their community. Um, I think it's really important. And I think one of the, going back with the rural, rural lens conversation is understanding that it is very, some of these remote communities, I just came from the North, um, these remote communities, it's really expensive um, to meet the basic needs of people in some of these remote communities. And they're important communities. They're important communities to forestry, important communities for energy, agriculture. Um, they contribute significantly to the GDP, but they're definitely more expensive to run. Um, transportation costs is one of the, the critical things and access to good people and access to services. So, so that conversation becomes more complex. So when I talk about that rural lens, it's an understanding that rural remote uh, comes with extreme complexities and needs to be considered in how you're funding, funding pots and how you approach uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal, fiscal capability of a lot of these municipalities. I want to turn to the next subject here, and it's about uh, property taxes, because there's a section in the uniquely rural platform that specifically talks about some of the key areas that you're hoping the next government picks up around municipal property taxes. I want to start with this question because I think it's an important one to get the idea of where the rural municipalities of Alberta is coming from. How does the reliance on property taxes, particularly from non-residential properties like oil and gas properties, properties impact the funding of infrastructure, service, and municipal operations? So, I, and I have this 
So I would say right now on a majority of the rural municipalities that are that are fairly remote, between 60 and 80 percent of their taxes are by industrial, mostly resource development. Sometimes it's it can be a, a forestry plant or otherwise, but 60 to 70 percent, pretty significant because, again, low populations. I'll, I'll take my municipality as an example. So. Uh, I think I have $9 million in, in industry uh, taxes off the top of my head. Um, and I bring in 1.4 million from residential taxes um, for, sorry, from farmland. So, um, but one, so if I could, if I quadrupled farmland, I still cannot replace <laughs> industrial in my County. And the assessment of farmland is based upon a bushel of barley from the eighties. So no matter what, the, the tax that's tied to agricultural land, it is impossible using the existing tax method for me to replace and or supplement uh, those industrial taxes. That reliance is 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 a bit of a house of cards. And, and a lot of municipalities know it. We do know it. We are definitely addicted to, to, to those taxes. Um, it's changing. Any of these legacy fields is changing. The oil and gas industry is changing. Uh, if you go 10 years in the future, that will definitely winnow down. Oil and gas will always be part of the, the rural Alberta landscape, but our reliance on oil and gas taxes to pay the bills will change significantly. If we don't have a mechanism to replace that, and in some cases, renewable has been a great uh, benefit to a few communities, um, that can start to bridge it. Looking for diversification, much like the province of Alberta, we're having it in a micro level every single day, is that the province of Alberta is very addicted to oil and gas taxes. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, a treasure for all of us. At the same time, it's a bit of a curse because it's not always going to be where it is right now. And there's every likelihood that we might have peaked. Uh, you might have, we might have seen the peak of oil and gas taxes in the last little while because we're seeing definitely the revenue that's coming from oil sands, for example, that is is looping up. So we've got some very hard fiscal decisions to make. Um, property tax and and assessment needs to be uh, properly evaluated. It needs to be modernized for sure. We need to modernize it. And we need to also be compassionate about it. We don't want to have taxes that are so high that it it, it pushes opportunities away and, and affects agriculture, which is one of our core things that we provide or affects forestry or, or industrial development. So yeah, very. it's a big conversation. It's a even difficult conversation amongst ourselves that, that we're having because there will need to be a change in, in taxation on agricultural land. And that is a complex conversation. You in this document, you you are calling for the provincial government to introduce, or I should say, reinstate a tax. And the both provincial parties, the NDP and the UCP, have said no, no new taxes. But RMA is saying that they'd like to see the reinstatement of the well drilling equipment tax, and this will help contribute, as according to the uniquely rural document, contribute to better balancing the needs of industry and municipalities. Why is this important to RMA? Well, it, it's first of all, it's very important because it was the whole idea of well drilling equipment tax is that when you're, when you're putting a new well in, which we need to understand what a new well is. I have a well literally being put in on the end of my quarter section. It's it's a six six well pad. They're fracking it. There's probably been, and I'm not even exaggerating, two thousand vehicles have driven down this road to actually service that new well installation that's going in beside my property. Um, so the well drilling equipment tax is actually tied to address those infrastructure impacts from that well. 2000, like it's literally, there's vehicles a day. There's, I've lived here for 20 years. That, that well has had more activity on it in a week than I've had in 20 years. And I'm not even exaggerating. So the well dr drilling equipment tax, they got rid of it as, as a, to help stimulate the oil and gas industry. Um, the price of oil and gas stimulates the oil and gas industry. So getting rid of the well drilling equipment tax quite literally was was the government of Alberta wrote a check with our butt and took away a tax form that's very important to my members. A significant amount of money is being left on the table that is going into the coffers of oil and gas companies that have some of the highest revenues they've had in decades uh, and free cash flow. So you've basically incentivized someone that's already making more money than they've made in at least the last 10 years. And so we wanted to reinstate it because it was a, it was, it was used as a consolation prize for hard discussions we had on assessment model review. And it was used as a consolation prize or a way to actually stimulate drilling. 
but it should have had a should have definitely had a ceiling or a floor. Uh, it shouldn't have been instilled. So we definitely it needs to come back. There is millions of dollars that uh, of revenue being lost to municipalities for for the infrastructure that's being involved with oil and gas and uh, critically important piece. So yes, and and the one thing about taxes and it's funny because you hear this we're in campaign season and people talk about taxes being so negative. <laughs> Every tax dollar that is spent in a rural municipality, you see it every day. It is literally, it flows straight back into the infrastructure, the roads you're on. Um, it is almost the most perfect tax. Property tax is almost the most perfect tax because you actually, it touches you every single day. It does not leave your municipality. It is invested in those infrastructure that you use. So our hope is both of these, both, both whoever becomes the government in the province of Alberta and both parties recognize how important that those taxes are to, for us getting the resource market, to, uh, getting resources to market and ensuring that we have the infrastructure we need to do so. Sticking on that uh, new well that's in your area, you know, as the Reeve of Pinocchio County, but you're hearing from uh, members from across uh, Alberta, but also in this document, you say uh, RMA is calling for the end of the property tax holiday on newly drilled wells. Now, you, you mentioned it perfectly beforehand that with the oil boom that we are seeing right now, uh, oil and gas industries are getting more uh uh, money for their oil. Uh, how would a the end of this property tax holiday help municipalities? Well, as we said, so we received a significant uh, decrease in, in our funding. Um, you know, going back to the conversations between new wells and the tax holiday uh, for shallow wells, because there's different pieces within the shallow well industry too. And and they actually had, a, the shallow well also had a reduction, which we probably didn't highlight in enough detail. So this is cut, cut, cut. So, so literally the government of Alberta has been basically <laughs> making tax changes on behalf of rural municipalities uh, to incentivize the industry that, that didn't at a time at a price point doesn't require incentivization. So it, it was basically a huge policy miss to be quite honest. And, and it could have been done in a different method. And in fact, what they did too, is they put a long date on it which anybody that understands the oil and gas industry, long dating oil and gas is, is that's a fool's game. Uh, there's no way you can predict where the future is going to go. There's too many moving parts to it. So our hope, our hope is an understanding. And at the same time, having an understanding that is there other ways to incentivize uh, and to actually provide during low dollar times, uh, is there a better way to deal with this? Have a price point, uh, anything below $55 a barrel, for example, start looking at some sort of tax incentives at that stage. Incentivizing oil at uh, at 80 to $90 a barrel, that's a ridiculous exercise. And one of the thing about taxes too is that most of these companies, uh, they're multinational in some ways, and they're actually from other countries. Any dollar that's not spent on tax leaves Alberta. Um, it leaves Alberta in the form of dividends. It leaves Alberta in the form of share buybacks. Um, and we want to keep some of that money in Alberta to maintain the infrastructure that, that helps the oil and gas industry. The other thing that we don't really recognize is that the oil and gas industry is definitely um, pretty happy with Alberta because you can come into Alberta and, and our grid road system is so developed that if you have an oil and gas development, chances are pretty good. You have a lot of infrastructure already there. Um, this The well by me, uh, I think they had to build maybe 200 meters of road, I think in total um to get to their well site pretty nice it was almost like a driveway right up to their right up to their 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 well this will be a 15 year well and the infrastructure was already in place to a high quality and that's because of of taxes paid by their neighbor oil gas companies uh that are adjacent as well I want to turn to the topic of municipal autonomy, and this is the big one because uh, we have one leader who ran on a platform for her leadership campaign about provincial autonomy, and I found it quite interesting that RMA used similar words about municipal autonomy. And I want to start with this question, Paul, and that is, how do you believe and how does RMA believe municipal autonomy has been eroded in the last few years or in recent years? I, I was I was talking to to one of my uh, one of my local senior uh, ratepayers and and I was chatting with them and and I said I said and he was asking me I can't remember what the topic was and he said he said well who makes those decisions and I said well there's somebody in an office uh, in a capital city and they're making these decisions they've never been out here 
They, they don't understand. They did it without talking to me. And he goes, oh, that Ottawa, you know? And I said, no, that was Edmonton. That, <laughs> that was the legislature. Like every, this, so we complain about how Ottawa treats us. Uh, the legislature and, and Edmonton does the same thing to rural municipalities on a regular basis. <laughs> I think it's important to understand that <laughs> that behavior is getting worse. Um, you know, they're starting to see us in many ways as a barrier or making decisions. And constantly I've said to, to many MLAs and ministers, you know, come and check with us first. We can give you ideas on whether a policy piece may or may not work. Um, I'll give you a perfect example with the fire. So on Monday, uh, two Mondays ago, um, rural municipal leaders from, from the areas that now are on fire in Alberta, um, said we, we need to have a quad ban in these areas. Like literally, quad, we need to put on a fire ban and a quad ban. Um, that was Monday. It took till Friday for the provincial government to put it in place. By Friday, uh, we went from 20 fires to, uh, we broke over 100 fires by that Friday. Um, so those municipal leaders pushed really hard. And that's an important discussion, understanding that we're boots on the ground. Uh, we are, are a good voice. We're eyes and ears on the ground. And it's important. And Probably in our package, the biggest conversations that I've had is on that municipal autonomy, understanding that, that we make very hard decisions at a local level. Um, we're concerned about the quasi-judicial agency. So the AUC is, is permitting renewable projects without considering uh, our land use, our, our land planning authority at municipalities. We see that with the AER, the NRCB, which is which deals with CFOs. They're, no, they're basically doing an end run around our legislative and statutory requirements for land use planning. And so our hope is understanding that we are, the one thing that we are good at, we're good at building roads and bridges in our municipalities, but we're also good at at land use planning. We are the pl land use planning authorities in rural Alberta. We protect agriculture. We make sure there's good neighbors. And at the same time, we promote economic development. And we are being ignored by, by other agencies. And in many cases, we're being ignored by this government in big policy pieces. So our hope is understanding that there's some things that we're really good at, and you should make sure we use, a, use us for it. You know, um, I want to stick on the municipal autonomy part for a second here. But I want to uh, I want to know about the calls for amendments to the Municipal Government Act, and you want the uh, MGA, particularly the next provincial government, to define service and establish a threshold for intermunicipal service. Why is that important to RMA members, and particularly in this time when the economic situation in Alberta and not just rural municipalities, but everyone is finding it hard economically? Yeah, and and so and defining <clears throat> defining what essential services, I think, is this goes back to the rural lens conversation. So, um, and this is you know, and this if this election isn't showing anything, and I hate to bring it up, but there's a Do rural it. urban divide. <laughs> I don't want to be the first one to say it, but there's a rural urban divide. And, and if, if, if there's anything that's showing that right now is this election. Essential services and municipalities, we both have a different worldview on it. And so our urban friends, um, they see pools and, and they see recreation as an essential service. Um, and rural municipalities see bridges and roads <laughs> as essential service and, and to the point of uh, an infrastructure. And so that difference is quite significant. So, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll even be a little bit chippy here. So in, in the intermunicipal framework conversations, there's muni urban municipalities that, that have, um, I've heard of a cattery. So they have too many stray cats in a municipality. So they actually fund a place for cats to go and they fix them. And then the cats have a cat playground. Um, it costs them $20,000 a year to run this, this facility. Um, and they believe that the county should be contributing to that facility because uh, they believe it's an essential service. That's not an essential service. That gets in a bit of that, that conversation. And I think undeniably we recognize recreation as an important piece. But we also have campgrounds and boat launches, and we have other recreation pieces, and we do see recreation as essential. But but and it's this view that how can you bring investment and jobs into a community? And so under the urban lens, um, if we have good rec facilities, we'll bring economic development into a municipality. Um, the Amazon facility data center that's just north of Calgary, <clears throat> I don't think they care how good the pools are. It's a data center. 
Um, they, that economic development was based on infrastructure access, services access, access to power, uh, price of land. What's the tax? What's the tax regime? That's what attracted those businesses. So, so we want to make sure that we're starting to at least have discussions and ensure that that we're talking about what is essential, what's the base service that we provide, and then beyond that, those are municipal choices that are made by municipalities. Daycare is a perfect example. There has there's urban municipalities that are involved in and funding daycare. That is not something that's that's really in our wheelhouse in many cases, and that should not be an essential service that's tied to to any dialogues you have from a funding perspective. That's a municipal choice, and I don't discount the choices around a cattery or or a choice that a municipality makes around daycare. But that essential service conversation, those are not services that that uh, that are essential to a community. So besides roads and bridges, what are essential services? under the umbrella that RMA's uh, lens is looking at right now. Is it, is there a library that's an essential service? Is there, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know of any other big uh, municipal buildings besides libraries, but what are the essential services that RMA is looking to say, okay, this is what I we believe is an essential service compared to what you believe, whether it be that cat playground or an Amazon uh, or a pool, what are the essential services that RMA is looking at? Well, I think, it, and it's it's interesting because I do think definitely uh, we've seen that the funding around um, uh, definitely funding around libraries we see that as essential. Um, but but we're we we see the world from an infrastructure standpoint. So uh, broadband, water, wastewater, um, you know that those conversations, waste, recycling, um, all those pieces we, we see we have that lens and understanding that 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 infrastructure piece. And, it, and not that we don't believe recreation is important, because it is definitely, we do recognize that recreation is important to the well-being of, of communities. But the one thing about rural municipal folks is we do take care of some of our own recreation ourselves. We tend to, tend to, you know, we'll go camping or we'll go out to certain areas. And, and it's not always facility-based. It can be place-based. And, and it's not speaking against the, the pools. I think they're essential. I have young kids, and, and I'm glad for, for, for the urban pools uh, that are close to us. But I think it's important. The other thing about rural Alberta is, is that you can have an arena in every single small town. And there's a big discussion that has those are expensive to run, uh, but every small town thinks they need an arena. We have a big discussion to be making in the next 10 years is that should every small town have an arena? And one of the things that's happening, one of the trends, and I don't want to sound like the worst Canadian ever, but there has been a decrease in participation in hockey. And so, but field and court sports is actually increasing significantly and soccer is taken by storm. Um, and so, these really expensive arenas are getting really tough on small communities. So, you know, we, this discussion I think needs to occur is what is, what do we need? How do we go forward with, 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 you know, building facilities and looking at what's essential. And we just want to have the dialogue and, and we want to learn from one another and, and see it with the other lens. And I think that's an important discussion. And, and I'm happy about the election because we, I'm having these conversations right now. No one ever asks me this question, <laughs> how we see the world. And I think it's an important part of the dialogue. And our hope is, is that we can move forward and at least start to get down to what is basic, what is basic requirements. Um, and every municipality has different service requirements and services that they provide. And I don't know all of them. I don't know what my neighbors are doing. I just know what I do. I, I, I will echo your sentiment about hockey because maybe if our NHL teams actually start playing well, maybe hockey will go back up. But until the Oilers and the Flames either make it to the Stanley Cup uh, finals, maybe hockey will be on a decline for a while. But I want to talk about something we talked about earlier, but I want to uh, go a little bit more in depth about the municipal autonomy aspect of it. Um the preservation of agriculture lands is very important to rural municipalities, particularly in this tough time, because a lot of family farms are in the backyards of your communities. How does a province-wide strategy and policy uh, developed by the provincial government and in conjunction with stakeholders and RMA help balance uh, the development of land and the preservation of agriculture land? Yeah, and this and this has always been uh, it's that balancing act and that struggle over land rights and 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 we've had this discussion quite a bit in my municipality. So the way for you to retire, my neighbors are land rich, cash poor. 
That is very typical <laughs> of multi-generational farming communities. And so in order for you, in many cases, to retire, um, subdivision is one of the only options to actually provide, get a bit of wealth out of, because you're wanting to, to, to have another generation take over your farm. Subdivision is an important part of, of that exercise. So we deal with this. I deal with this in Pinocchio County literally on a weekly basis around these discussions is the rights of the landowner to subdivide in order to get some cash out of the farm. So the farm is still in production and ensuring that the subdivision design isn't impacting agriculture and taking agricultural capability out of the discussion. Um, it is nuanced. And, and I've, I've looked, I've looked at the literature and I've looked in other jurisdictions and you don't want to go too far one direction and say, no matter what, we're protecting this type of land for this use. Um, because it, that gets very complex, but also recognize that we have industrial development around Edmonton on some of the finest land in the province of Alberta. The industrial heartland, which is an economic engine of this province, is on some real kick butt agricultural lands. So it's not like we haven't done this before. I've never approved a subdivision on type one soil in Pinocchio County. Um, I have never taken land out of agricultural production that was a higher grade agricultural production, but definitely I've subdivided land that had had grazing opportunities. So it's very nuanced. I'm, we need to have this discussion now for your exact point. Um, so re renewables, perfect example. There's been renewable projects that have been approved on irrigable land. So land that actually can have a pivot on it, have three crops a year. We're talking knock it out of the park, massive contribution to agriculture in the province of Alberta. And instead of having that in production, they've thrown solar panels on it. So we've taken food, land that could create food, and we're harvesting the sun um, in an industrial capacity. We want to make sure that we're having that discussion. Is that land better as, as covered with solar panels or is it better to create food? Personally, I think it's probably better to create food if there's an alternative place to put those solar panels that doesn't take food out of production. Right now, definitely, regardless of what your view of the world is, we are already seeing the impacts of climate change, a hotter, drier future. We're seeing that right now. I'm coughing during this interview. Why am I coughing? Because it's really smoky out there. Why'd that happen? Drier, hotter future. We actually need to increase our agricultural production and our, our arable land in this province in order to feed ourselves in a hotter, drier future. So we need to actually have more agricultural capability, not less. And I think that Ontario has been dealing with this, that the golden horseshoe, and if you actually go into the Grimsby South area, the wine country and all the fruit country, now those are beautiful, massive, crazy, huge homes. And they've taken agricultural production out of place. And that's going to start to become a real problem. We need to feed ourselves. Um, we can't overprotect because we need to realize that there needs to be some sort of mechanism at the, at the private landowner in order for them to have a certain level of income and or not to be land rich and cash poor to balance that act. But I, we definitely need, need to take some bold steps. I think you'll see a lot more from RMA. Um, agricultural preservation become a really core piece because if we look 10 years down the road, we need to increase our agricultural production, not decrease it. And we cannot have urban spread. We can't have misuse of land. We can't cover everything with solar panels to, to, to battle a climate change future and take food production out of that conversation. It is a very big discussion that we need to have moving forward. And, and we're having it uh, at the local level, we're having it at the provincial level, and we need to have it as well at the national level. And we need to start making sure that we're not making poor land choices. Uh, and we're making sure that there's certainty too for industry, uh, certainty too for land use decision-making and need to consider agricultural lands as an important conversation. In my municipality, every land use decision, the first question that we ask is, is uh, agricultural preservation. We ask that with every single land use development. The AUC does not ask that question. The AER does not ask that question. The NRCB does not ask that question. Alberta Transportation does not ask that question. All these other quasi-judicial and other decision-making bodies do not consider agricultural preservation in their land use planning. We could probably talk about agriculture for a few hours, but I want to turn to healthcare because it, it's so timely that we're having this conversation because I was just at, as I said to you, I was just at the Tom Baker Cancer Center this morning and I was uh, just sitting beside someone in the reception area and he was actually from Clearwater County. So he had to drive, I think he said about 45 minutes, almost an hour and a half, one way to a doctor's appointment because A, there's no cancer treatment facilities in Clearwater County, but B, the closest facility for him is Calgary. 
how does the challenges and limited access to healthcare and social services affect communities in Alberta? And what are you hoping to, the next provincial government does to address some of these challenges that municipalities and rural municipalities are dealing with? Yeah, the the best study I've ever seen on on uh, health and life expectancy was done by the Ag Service Boards of, of Alberta. So that the uh, or the Ag Fieldmen, the Ag Fieldmen Association, actually actually commissioned a study to talk about rural life expectancy and quality of life. And the average rural person, and the belief is, oh, I live in the city, I, I'm all exposed to car exhaust, and you know, I must. You know, it's tough living in the city and I'm, I don't live as long. Actually, the reverse is true. Uh, in fact, the, it's, it was about two or three years, our life expectancy of rural Albertans is actually less. And it's because of that access conversation, uh, access to care, early intervention, um, having the ability to access or, you know, not getting that care early, having things go too long. Um, again, again, as you were saying, that distance from care. Um, and so we've created this hub and spoke model. And what we've done is we've made probably one of the biggest mistakes you could ever make is that you've always, you're under this base assumption that bigger is better. We need to centralize. If we centralize, then bigger is better. In this modern day, what we're seeing is that we're actually seeing uh, going to the office isn't required for a lot of people's jobs. Going to a major health center, you can actually start to outsource some of that technology and decentralize some of this care and provide better care. Because what we've learned too uh, in, in the health of, of people, it's, it's, a, it's as much about the relationship as it is about the treatment. It's the conversation, it's around the care, it's the things that lead up to it, it's that early intervention. Those are the discussions that we have. And the further someone is away from that care, the more likelihood is that things can get to, can get get away on you, and you're not dealing with those conversations. So the and and is that, it a driving golden... force to get people to? Is it a driving force of people leaving your communities as well? When people say, I I I'm going to have to have treatments five days a week in Calgary, and I I can't drive two hours and not be at the hospital, or I'm going to have to get a hotel room in downtown Calgary to get treatments because the back and forth would be. A killer on me, but B on my family as well, who have to take time out of their busy schedules, leave work, get time off and go help me deal with my health issues while I'm in Calgary. Yeah, undeniably, you know, where you're going to live, that that care, regardless of what, what stage you're at. Yeah, undeniably, people have to have to move to the, the, the closer centers. And what we're also seeing is that, that because of this trend, this lack of local service, um, you're getting overrun. The Red Deer Hospital is at capacity. Calgary, you you probably saw was probably rocking and rolling, busy as all business when you were in, at the the Tom Baker. And so we we need to pull some of that those resources out. But undeniably, that, those decisions are being made. If you have a complex care requirement, living rural is impossible, um, and it shouldn't be. You know, in fact, even if even if you're actually on dialysis, some folks they just they just can't live rurally anymore. They they no longer uh, age in place. Um, if you look at our system, what we've learned too is that aging in place economically is a great benefit to the citizens of Alberta. Not only to the individual, because it's great to age in place. I want to live in my community. I want to live in my house. I want to make sure I can be take care of myself or be taken care of in my house is a way cheaper than centralizing me and throwing me in an institution, institutional care scenario. And so we've learned that and we've, we've, we've built on that. We need to break that hug, hub and spoke model into, into a, a different program. And also we have tremendous capacity that's not being used. There's operating centers in this province in small towns that were built into hospitals that were made in the eighties and the nineties that are not being utilized to their full extent. Um, some of the care that, that you require, you could have you could have a wonderful time uh, staying at a beautiful hotel in, in Rimby, getting all the care you need um, and and be have access to services. Um, I think there's some great opportunities there. There's a there's a colonoscopy guy in Pinoca, and that's all he does. He's got their operating room and he does colonoscopies, which is awesome. You go to Pinoca, you get to go get a colonoscopy. Go about your day. I've never it's heard fantastic. someone say it's awesome to go get a colonoscopy, but <laughs> here we are in 2023, Paul. I think I think uh, medical tourism is a conversation we need to have, but we don't have enough time today. I think there's some great opportunities to build on that. But, so but it does of, become what, a resource conversation for sure. 
one of the areas that you're asking the next provincial government to look at is to incentivize young professionals to work in rural settings, to actually give them uh, a, a sort of incentive to do that. And you're actually calling on uh, the next provincial government to create rural specific seats in post-secondary healthcare programs. Do you believe yeah. that is a good first step to alleviating some of these issues that rural communities like yours and all across Alberta are facing? Well, we need to do that because other other jurisdictions in Canada are doing the same. <laughs> we are competing for the same people, and and so we need to have an eye on that. And and you know, there's a decrease in general practitioners in Canada. Uh, a lot of folks just are going through medical school and not going down that route. Uh, we need to incentivize them. And and the new generation of doctors, I've had this conversation uh, with lots of folks, is you're getting burnout from the ones that have that sort of, you know. Generation X and baby boomer that would work 60 80 hours a day. Uh, the younger generations are a lot smarter than my generation that work. I'm going to work. I'm going to probably die at work because I'm an idiot. Um, they're wanting to have a lifestyle balance. So it takes two to three doctors now to replace an existing uh, general practitioner community. I'm seeing that all over the province. It's a lifestyle choice. It's they just don't want to work themselves to death and good on them. But it does require us to have three to replace one in many cases. And and the one is burning out because <laughs> they work 68 hours a week. So I think it's good. The same We've had the same conversation with veterinarian services too, and the government's made some good changes on vet services. Um, it you know In order for you to move to a rural, rural, rural setting, I love it. It may not be for everybody, but you want to draw them in because I've met a lot, of, a lot of doctors that have moved to small communities and they love it. And I've met a lot of people that moved to small communities and they left very quickly. Um, it's it, it's really a different type of person and we need to attract those people that want to be there and to give it a good shot and give it a good try. This is a very timely question, particularly what's going on in Alberta right now around the fire services and the fire departments across Alberta. Um, RMA is calling for more compensation be provided to municipal fire services in situations where they are required to respond to emergencies. Shocker. The province of Alberta is currently under an emergency due to uh, lack of funding, cutbacks that we've seen over the last few years. Why do you believe, why does RMA believe that uh, providing more compensation to fire services is important, particularly to rural municipalities? Well, right right now, um, <laughs> the, the, right now is probably the most critical time. We, we are, if... if, if um, Professor Flanagan from the, from Thompson University, right in the, in in BC, um, he's one of the foremost forestry experts. Uh, the models are saying that what we're seeing right now is expected to this is this is this is just the beginning of of what we're going to see from a from a uh, forest fire standpoint. I've been elected uh, 16 years. I opened my emergency operations center two Wednesdays ago on a fire that was almost un out of control and almost unfightable. Um, and so we are relying quite a bit on resources that have not been exposed to this situation. There's 88 fires right now active in the province. We haven't even hit lightning season yet, Chris. So these are not, this isn't even close to what the potential is. Um, and so we need to really look at the funding of these services and ensure that we're, we're providing the best resources possible. And not to burden municipalities, uh, my biggest worry at this stage, and the government's been actually really amazing during this this provincial state of emergency that they're saying, if, you, if you're if you know tapping out on money, we'll find mechanisms. And we've had those conversations, but we need to formalize that. We need to actually make sure we have all of our pieces in, in place. As I said, this was seen very early, the scenario we're in right now. Uh, it was seen by the folks that I represent, and we need to make sure that we are we are lining up all of our ducks to take this on because it's very scary. It's very stressful. It requires a tremendous amount of resources, and this isn't over yet. Uh, I think we're just seeing the beginning of it too, as well. I was in uh, I was in Valley View uh, Monday morning at uh, I left at 11 a.m. and they evacuated at 1:30. Um, uh, right now, Swan Swan uh, Swan Hills they evacuated. Um, Fox Creek is completely evacuated and that fire still is out of control. Um, it requires a tremendous amount of resources. And, and a lot of these folks have been fighting fires for about a week and a half. They are burning out. Uh, the good folks in Drayton have worked really, really hard. Um, but we really need to coordinate our, coordinate our resources. And speaking of the budget cuts and initial attack, it's an interesting conversation that we've had. 
uh, the, the rapid attack conversation, it seemed like it was a line item and, and the conversation by at the time Devin Dreeshin was saying that uh, we can save $13 million, we're changing how we're going to fight fires and it's been part of the election has been the rapid attack. I used to be a park ranger back in the early 90s. Um, and, and those folks didn't just repel into every single fire It was only about 2% of the time, those folks were would actually they were the response team that dealt with the remote lightning strike fires. Um, that, that if you get them early, they don't get out of control. Because here's the conversation that I've been having all over this province and I was having conversation with our members. There is so much fuel on the ground because what we've done is we've fought every fire and we haven't necessarily managed the forest. We are creating monster fires if we don't deal with them early and start to do some forest management discussions because the fuel is so much that these are unfightable fires. They create their own weather when they get this big and there's so much fuel that they are unfightable. It's all about egress and get people out of there. So we need to have a large discussion, a big discussion around landscape management and risk management. It needs to come up post, post this event, probably post this summer uh, in the fall when we get into a safe place too as well. But it's a big discussion because my folks are the ones that are that are fighting these fires. And quite honestly, typically it's with volunteers. These folks have other lives too. They're doing this off the side of their desk and uh, they've been amazing. But, uh, but we need to have a big discussion around fire safety because I think this is the beginning of a cycle that we're gonna probably experience for the foreseeable future. I want to turn to our last subject here because I am cautious of time and we're almost at the hour mark. I want to talk about the last point that the uniquely rural platform lays out and it's around rural internet. How does the lack of reliable internet connectivity impact rural communities across Alberta? The, my, my common line is that I'm the Riva Pinoca County. We have one of the lowest, if not the lowest taxes in the province of Alberta, very healthy fiscally, great infrastructure, great schools, uh, and, uh, and I think the Reeve and the leadership team is amazing. The number one question people ask when they move to Pinoca County is how fast is the internet? They don't care about any of the other things I've listed. They want to know if there's access to high speed internet. Uh, so whether it's work, economic development, uh, this is an enabling investment. Uh, and we have seen significant investments in, in uh, internet at the same time, I was, I've been driving around for the last three days. I have dead spots for phone. I know lots of folks that have zero internet. Um, so we still need to work really hard. So we're continuing to advocate for this, even though there's been large funding announcements. This is, a, this is an essential service. Um, this is required by all Canadians and all Albertans need to have access to very good quality, very affordable high-speed internet. It's essential for democracy, it's essential for learning, and it's essential for economic development. And if we're gonna actually grow as a, as, a, as a province, investing in rural internet is a critical investment that we need to make. On the flip side of that, wireless, mobile wireless it, it, a service as well, because I know when I drove from here to uh, Calgary to Saskatoon a few months ago, um, by the time I hit outside of Mountain View County, my service was gone and I had no mobile service and I was probably without mobile service for about, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour. And then it would come in and spotedly come and go as I drove. I, I can imagine uh, better access to mobile wires, wireless service benefits rural communities as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was in uh, well, four years ago, I was in rural Zimbabwe. Um, I was actually on safari uh, on horseback I had cell service the entire time. I called an Uber to pick me up from my safari in rural Zimbabwe. I called an Uber. The Uber came, picked me up. I had cell service all the way back to the place I was staying in rural Zimbabwe. My calls didn't drop. My phone, I had high-speed internet the whole time. And I cannot get a call from connection from my house when I'm driving to Highway 2. 33 kilometers, I will drop the call twice. And I live in one of the most developed places on the planet Earth. So we need to call to task uh, those, those service providers, and there should not be a drop call in this province, both from a safety perspective. At the same time, we have some of the highest bills in the, in the OECD. In the G7, we have the highest phone bills. We have the highest data bills. And everybody tells me, oh, it's because we're spread out enough for that conversation. Um, the technology exists, all it requires investment. We sh there should not be a drop call in this province. 
at all, ever, anywhere. Oh, you muted on me there, Chris. Sorry, I coughed and I took a drink and I muted myself. My last question for you, because I want to let you go and get back to being Reeve of your county and president of RMA, but what else haven't we talked about here that you want to make sure my listeners, my viewers know about this document and about what you're hoping to hear in the next half of the last half of this election? Well, and I, I'll go back to my other point, too, about the rural-urban divide. I think that we need to recognize that this election is really symbolic of that. 85% uh, of the population is, is identified as, as urban, 15% of the population is rural. That being said, uh, the good folks that are rural are providing the food, the water, the energy. Um, we're important partners in what makes Alberta successful. And I think that we need to, this election is going to show this divide in, in essence, both politically and ideological. But we need to come back and actually work in a nonpartisan way, in a non-ideological way to solve the biggest problems that we have for one another. People that live in a remote community that are providing uh, great contributions to the GDP of the province of Alberta should have access to the same care as someone that lives in one of our downtown centers. And we need to ensure that we're leveling that play field and we're making sure we're doing that together. That's what makes Alberta better. We're only as tall as the, as the person that's at their lowest place. So we need to actually do that. So I think post-election, whoever becomes government, regardless of what the party is, we need to start actually healing that and getting back to, to, to that governance conversation. The success of rural government is our nonpartisan nature that we actually, we don't deal with ideology, we solve problems. We don't talk about what party you're in. We don't talk about uh, what your view of the world is. We get down to actually the land use planning and we need to do that at the provincial level. So my hope is, is that we can, we're gonna, it's gonna be self-evident exactly where that divide exists. But I think we should spend the next four years trying to break that divide down and start to have some conversations that go outside of rural and urban. And we just start talking about being Albertans and what everybody should have access to, whether it's from a resource standpoint, from a land use planning standpoint. And the one thing I hope people recognize is that uh, municipal leaders, they're the best form of government because of the closest form of government and their accountability is immediate. Um, if Pinocchio County quit doing what we're doing, you'd know us pretty quick. You would notice very fast in my my municipality if I just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm done for multiple reasons. I'm no longer going to do this job. And we we collectively as a group just stop doing what we're doing. You'd figure out right away. Actually, my my side road would be washboard in about a week anyways. It wouldn't take very long. I'd get some phone calls anyways. Why aren't you getting this done? But uh, so I think it's important. And I think that uh, we need to realize that our strengths are, are, are we've or, we've originated in rural Alberta. We we're extremely ag agrarian culture uh, when when Alberta was 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 being settled, um, and I think that we need to have this conversation going forward to ensure that we're we're saying you know what the rural Alberta was the beginning of of Alberta, and uh, it's going to be the future of Alberta too as well. And I think it's an important discussion. So, um, and I and people ask me if I have any insight on on who's going to win the the election. And uh, I think that Albertans will get the government they deserve. Thank you once again to Reeve Paul McLaughlin for sitting uh, down with us and joining us for a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, the links to all the uh, the uh, candidate guides, the platform guides, the rural municipality of Alberta's uh, uniquely rural uh, website are in the show notes. So if you want, scroll down and you can check them out there. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this great conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button right below so that you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up over the next few weeks, and we can't wait to share their stories with you. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us continue to grow and produce more high quality content like today's episode. Every little bit helps, and we appreciate your support. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. Now, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, and this is the big one, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real in-life person conversations with the people in our lives. And even have conversation with the candidates and candidate volunteers who are knocking at your door today. I also want to take a moment and say uh, we wish the people up in northern Alberta a very 
very uh, uh, speedy uh, evacuation. Hopefully everything is going well. Um, please follow all local instructions. Stay updated with correct information. Go to the Alberta Wildfire app if you have to. And also, and this is the big one, please be safe. As a former firefighter for rural Alberta, I know it is challenging and there's a lot of uh, emotions that are running high right now. So please, please be safe in this crucial time and memories can be rebuilt. You can't. So please follow instructions, be safe and Make sure that you are prepared to evacuate within 72 hours and have your evacuation package ready. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. I want to thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. Remember, just keep talking.